Father, we give you praise. Father, we praise you in the name of Jesus, Son of God. Father, we declare we love you. We declare we honor you. We declare that we need you. Father, we need you. We appreciate you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you, King of Kings, for the grace to be in your presence this morning. Your presence remains our advantage. Father, we humble ourselves before you. We have come to learn. We have come to grow. We have come to encounter your graces. We've come to encounter your love, your power, your wisdom, your light. Let your words be imparted on us. Open our eyes, King of Kings, to the mysteries that come from heaven. My God and my Father, teach us from your word so that we know your ways and walk in them. Help us to give ears to recognize your voice speaking to us and follow you. We don't want to just be hearers of the word. Show us how to be doers of your word, Father. Enable us to respond the way we should and we obey you. Help us to apply our hearts to your instructions and our ears to your words of knowledge. My God and my Father, may your word collect our attitude. May your word remind us what our purpose is or not. May it cleanse our hearts and give us hope that we can rise above our limitations. May it be food to our soul that we cannot live without it. Help us to know you better through your word, O oh Lord, my God and my Father. As we come into your presence to learn how the Son was given to demonstrate true humility, may we go with what you've packaged for us today, King of Kings. Minister unto us, my Father, my God. Lord, let whatever you've packaged from your mystery come clearly unto us. Lord, I come before you as a vessel. Breathe through me, speak through me, hear through me, teach through me. May I be a partaker of your word today. Lord, cleanse my lips, cleanse my heart, that whatever I say today, I'm used by you. Let me decrease as you increase. Hide me behind your cross, O oh my God and my Father. Take me the school of spirit that I will download from that realm. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. I thank King of Kings that you are all on the call today. I bless his holy name and glorify him because it is him that you are in his presence. It is because of his grace and mercies that we bow. We get out of our beds and come to be in his presence and search for him. It is because of his grace. We are not any different from anyone, but because of his grace and love for us, we are able to come into his presence. For this month of December, we've been dealing with divine revolution of God. We've been tapping from many ministers and they've been speaking different things. And for each, we praise the Lord for having used them differently. From ninth, we've been talking the Son, the Son, Lord of a temptation, the Son given everlasting Father, the Son given to demonstrate true humility is where we are today. So we've discussed the Son over and over again. So today I've been given to minister the Son given to demonstrate true humility. As my brother Julian had introduced me, I'm Prosi Komhimbo to Moesuji. I'm here by God's grace. Though I don't know much, but God is my teacher. And whatever I'm going to say, it is him. It will not be me. I surrender myself to him to use me. We are going to talk about the son given to demonstrate true humility. We'll talk about talk humility. What is humility? Humility by world's definition often implies diminished self-confidence. But humility in the Bible means getting your confidence from God, getting your confidence from God, who loves and values you more than you do yourself. God loves us and values us more than ourselves. That's what we have to know. The biblical humility means believing what God says about you 
over anyone else's opinion, including your own opinion. Your opinion, others' opinion, that's not matter. It is what God thinks about you. When he looks at your heart, when he looks at your actions, what does God think about you? Myself, I might look at myself as a humble girl. And you know, we usually have the funny word, I'm from a humble background. But with God's lenses, who am I? Am I humble? It requires embracing who you are in Christ over who you are in the flesh. Who am I in Christ? Who am I to my father? You know, sometimes when we look at ourselves, it does not mean that um, being simple, working gently, putting on different things makes you humble. No, it is about who you are in Christ over who you are in the flesh. To be biblically humble is to be so free of concern of your own egg that you openly elevate others around you. There are people who never accept that someone is better than them. There are some of us who think we know it all. There are some of us who think we are above everyone. Humble people, they do not know everything. They accept that they do not do. And a lot of what they think they know, they know it is distorted and wrong. They do not think they are correct all the time. To be humble is to always remember that God is bigger, he's smarter, and he is more powerful than us. It is is believing what God says is more true than what you think. It is to trust that what God says about you is right. It is not about what you think about you, your own self, as I had earlier said. Sometimes God uses different vessels to talk to us. And the moment they start telling us what communication God has given unto them to give to us, we start arguing. Sometimes when I tell my friends, sometimes I'm saying, do you know we are so proud? We need to deal with A, B, C, D. And they're like, no, me, I'm not. But sometimes I admit, sometimes you are proud. But when it is brought unto us, do we accept or we decide to argue with others to prove ourselves to be right? You know, brethren, there are many benefits of being humble. Gone are the pitfalls of thinking too high or too low of yourself. You are free to be and think about yourself less. We do not have to think ourselves above everything all the time. It does not cost us anything. Sometimes when we have to accept that we are low, when your confidence is in Christ alone, you are free to focus on others, to treat them with elevated, regarding by honoring and serving them. You can consider others more important than yourself. It is not that all the time you're the one everyone should focus on, everyone should see. The world starts from you and ends from you. There's a time I was working uh, at an airport. I would even go to work with cameras because I thought without me, work would not go on. I thought I was the, the overall of that place because when I would be there, everyone would be consulting me. Everyone would be asking me this. At that point, my humility went down. I became so proud and so arrogant that I thought with my absence, work will not go on. Behold, when I left, even work was better than the time I was there. Because of that spirit of pride, I was brought down. Just know that when you're not humble, it is an attack from the pit of hell. The more you see the glory of God, the more you become humble, and the more you will encounter God, and the more humility will be birthed. But when we always see others lower than us, and we want to see ourselves above everyone else, we will never come from where we are. We are going to remain stagnant. We are never going to grow. We already think we are better. When in the worst part, the more you become 
proud, the more you go down. We need to get to a time and we say, I want more of you, God. If you're hungry of getting him, you will see him. We need to retreat and go and break down before our creator, our master, and we tell him we need him. The church is moving on. It is not going to wait for you to come. Humility is a virtue that begets all other good virtues. Being humble means being teachable. If you're humble, you are ready to learn how to be patient, how to be kind, and most importantly, you are willing to be transformed by God. You are willing to be transformed by God. The moment you humble yourself before God, the moment you go up, up behind the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you in your time. He will bring you above yourself. He will take you to a level you have never imagined. Humility will have to connect you to your growth. Without humility, you will never grow. We have to be students all the times because one of the definitions of humble is being teachable. If you want to model humility, you must first get it yourself. The best way to learn humility is to be a student to everyone. Everyone had something to teach you. Even a little child had something to tell you. My daughter can sit down, she just stay, and sometimes she tells you, no, this is not the way to do it, mommy. I think you're missing something. Last time you discussed this and it is like this. You have to learn whether it's a little baby, whether it's a mad person on the street, whether it is a cleaner, let us have that teachable spirit. Yes, at times we need to discern what we are being taught, but most importantly, are we humble enough to sit at the feet of anyone and know what they are saying? Humility is a necessary step to salvation. As he said, unless you turn and become as a little child, you will no way enter into the kingdom of God. And it is necessarily practical. After coming to Christ, we have the plaques to die of ourselves. The moment you die of yourself, yourself will go down and God will rise in you and you become a better person person, a better vessel, better than who you are. We are talking about humility. For people who've just come in, our talk today is the sign given to demonstrate true humility. From Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Right now, I'm talking about what is humility. That's what where we have reached. What Paul said about humility. Paul said, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power might reside in me so that I take pressure in weaknesses, insult, catastrophes, persecutions, and in pressures because of Christ. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10. 2 Corinthians 12, 19. God's glorious power is more evident that it is displayed in weak vessels. It is a humble vessel God uses to achieve his purpose on earth. As we recognize our limitations, we will depend more on God for our effectiveness rather than our energy, rather than our effort, rather than our talent. Our limitations not only help develop Christian character, but also deepen worship because in admitting we are affirming God's strength. And the moment we affirm God's strength, the moment we glorify God, the moment we know God is bigger, stronger, and mightier, we will bring ourselves down. We will not want to take his glory in his praise. Like when someone praises you, wow, that is a very nice teaching, or that is a very nice presentation, like people work in offices, are you the best employee of the year? And you think you've done it on your own? 
You think all was because you're powerful, you know. I went to good schools. I sat under good teachers. My supervisor was the best. No, it was the power and the grace of God that brought you to that level. It is not your teacher. It is not your supervisor. It is not yourself. You might have contributed, but the higher part of it was God's contribution. Oh, you girl, you've made it in life. You no longer walk. You bought this car. Yes, I bought it but the fact is it was God's grace it was God's power that made me get that far for in Romans 12 3 Paul says for I say through the grace that was given to me to every man who is among you not think of himself more highly than he ought to think but think reasonably as God has apportioned each person a made of it Paul exalts Christians to be humble and to use what God has given for the good of his body. Some of us, as had, I had said earlier, overestimate ourselves. The key to a honest and actually self evaluation is knowing the basis of our self worth our identity in Christ. Apart from him, we are not capable of worth service. Apart from God, apart from recognizing that we are here on assignment, apart from knowing that everything we do, we do through him, apart from knowing he's the author, the finisher, the redeemer of our lives, we'll always be proud and will not be human. Like in Philippians, Paul says, do nothing out of rivalry or consent, but in humility, in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Again, when you look at 1 Corinthians 1 12, Paul points out that God chooses the weak and the lower, it put to shame the things that are stronger by elevating the weak and lowly in our own eyes. God shows us that our judgment is not the right judgment. The judgment we use, the judgment we use to measure all yardstick, it is not. Right. We have to stick to God because God has chosen what is significant and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing, what is viewed as something so that no one can boast in his presence. He's a jealousy God. The moment we try to take all that glory, he will lower us down. And the moment you start contending with God, the moment God is fighting you, all the earth will fight you. The plants will, the walls will, people will. When everything is against you, check yourself what is not right. It serves us as a reminder that God is all powerful. God is internal. God is omniscient creator. He is the one who is the author. He's the one who does everything. We cannot save ourselves, but we are saved by grace. We are elevated by God. We should be humble. We, choose, we should choose to estimate ourselves and others as God does, not using our physical eyes to start judging people and seeing other people. As we continue with our scripture today, our God was actually Humanity preferred has been said that humility is recognizing and acknowledging one's total dependence upon the Lord and seeking his will for every decision. It is realizing that we ourselves are nothing, but we are everything in Christ. Our Lord sets the tone for our attitude. He says, Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Matthew 23, 12. And James says the same. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6. James 14, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. When you humble yourself, God will lift you up. We must humble ourselves before God. And this will enable us to humble before others. If you're not able to humble yourself before others, you cannot even humble yourself before God. 
If you cannot have yourself before people, you know what about the one you don't see. We have to learn how to humble ourselves. Peter emphasizes the same virtue, connecting our humility before other believers with our humility before God. Yes, all of us must be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, let's humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he will exalt us in due time. But when we don't humble ourselves, we will not be exalted in due time. Instead, we will be brought down. As my brother had already read our scripture for the day, I will read it again. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. As Peter taught us, have this in your mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death. Yes, the death on the cross. When you look at our scripture, it has many points to pick up. Having this in your mind, which was also in Christ's mind, who existing in the form, he was existing in the form of God. He was existing in the form of God, but did not consider equality with God, did not consider equality with God because he was a humble son, of which it is said that we should grasp this. He emptied himself, he emptied himself, took the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. He was in the likeness of God, but he emptied himself, the likeness of men. He was found humble. He humbled himself. What do we have to empty ourselves as we continue discussing and sharing? Which form are we? How do we look at ourselves? Whom do we think we are? Paul goes on to say that Jesus emptied himself. He made himself nothing. Clearly, God cannot cease to be God. So Jesus did not cease as the same have asserted. He did not give up his divine attributes. He simply limited the independent use of certain attributes and prerogatives while on earth. He did not change. He did not become someone else. He did not become like you exactly, but he knew who he was. He knew what his assignment was. He knew when to step down some attributes. He knew when to lower himself to a level of a servant. He knew the time and the season he was in. He knew what his calling expected him to do. In order to do what he was called for, he had to lower himself to our level. It was only the precondition of glory when we look at John 17, 5. He did not change, except for the brief time on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the soldiers in the garden came and they flew back after a flash of his glory, when he told them, I am I. And because of that divine revolution, they could not believe it. They fell down and went. That's when he came out. But still, he did not bring it out the way it was. Paul explains the main sense of how Christ emptied himself in the rest of Philippians 2. That we are looking at, taking the form of a servant, being obedient to the death on the cross. When Paul says that Jesus took on the form of a bond servant, you know, when they talk about bond servant, they are talking more of slaves. They are talking more of people who are undermined, people who are looked like nobodies. He means that he volunteered because he took on 
So he voluntarily adopted the very nature of a servant. He did not cease to be God in any sense but he added his divine nature to a true human nature. Jesus' nature was exactly like ours, except that was joined to a divine nature. It was not mixed. It was not branded. It was without sin. Although his body was a subject to the results of fall of man, such weirdness, aging, death, but he did not change. When Paul says that Christ was found in appearance as man, he means that if you looked at Jesus, you would not have thought of him like a superman or God, like someone who is so special, but rather he was a normal looking man that was born into a family as a baby, grew to maturity as well. And in every other observed way, he was a complete human man. Sometimes I wonder if I was a daughter of that nature, I'm Jesus. I would want to shout to the whole world, I have powers to heal, I have powers to do this. Like most sometimes when God has given us some gifts of prophecy and we just prophesy one or two things, we want people to carry us on their legs. We want to be felt like we want our Bibles to be carried. We want people to start calling us Papa. If someone calls me like Prophet, he does not put a prophet proceed, I take an offense. Is that humility? But Jesus took the nature of men. And when you would meet him, you would push him. You would, the Pharisees were abusing him. People are calling him all names, but he never retaliated back. But if it was me, then I don't know. I would want to rub it in people's faces. Look here, I'm a, child, I'm a son of God. I'm Jesus, the one that you've been talking about. I have power to do this. But he humbled himself. He demonstrated true humility. When you look at the orthodox statement concerning the person of Christ, he is undiminished type, a perfect humanity, united without confusion in one person forever. To deny either the full or perfect death of our Lord or his complete humanity is to fall into serious hearsay. So what Paul was saying is that Lord Jesus went from the highest place in the universe as internal God, to take on human existence and that not as a king, not as a powerful warrior, not as a son of the mighty, the all-knowing, the omnipresent, but as a lowly servant. He went even lower. He demonstrated to humility. As in our offices, when I'm a daughter of a CEO or a director, I will feel so big. Sometimes we want to rub it into everyone's forces. This is my father. This is my mother. Even sometimes when you're a far related cousin, you want to rub it into people's faces. This is our territory. Excuse me. When we go to churches, you find your a relative, a, a friend. In fact, in fa a friend of a provost assistant. You want everyone to hear it. You want to go on the top hat and delete it on people's face. You want to assume that authority. You're a cashier, people deserve their pay, but because you're more privileged to be in that seat, how do you operate in that seat? How do you work with people? You're privileged to occupy a better seat. What is your assignment in that seat? I usually tell people where I sit, I know I'm on assignment. This is my father. I work for the kingdom, my father's kingdom. How am I representing my father here on planet earth? In this seat in office that I occupy, in the cathedral where you sit, in your various places, in your various ministries where you work, are you representing your father's kingdom with humility or you want to rub it in your face in a negative way that here I am, the daughter of the most high, what kind of representation are you doing in that particular place where God has pressed you? To grow in humility, we must understand Christ's death, which was the most shameful death, imaginable death. It would have been amazing enough for the internal God to come to this earth as a mighty king. Don't you think so? He would have wanted to come. Like you see the first children, you're using chompers, what? 
he would, it would have been wonderful. But it was really amazing that he came as a humble servant. It is almost beyond comprehension that he even went lower and died. And even more staggering, his death was not a noble death, but a horrible, ignorable death of a common criminal. For the Jews, whoever was hanged on a tree was accursed by God. If you want to look, you can look in Deuteronomy 21-23. For the Gentiles, death by crucifixion was the lowest and the most despicable form of death imaginable. The Roman citizens were exempt from crucifixion. The Romans would not put them on that tree. They were exempted. The poet said, Far be the very name of a cross, not only from the body, but even from the thought, the eyes and the ears of the Roman citizens. They would not see that tree. They would not go there. So Paul is saying that Jesus went from the height of heights to the depth of depth. We will never begin to know what glory he gave up for what humiliation he suffered on our behalf until we are with him in glory. That's how he demonstrated true humility. But to grow in humility, we must think about the staggering implications of what he meant for the holy one, the glorious one, the eternal son of God to take on human flesh and not the flesh of a king, but of a servant and stopping even low, he willingly and obediently went to the cross for our sins, went to the cross for our sins. Some of us cannot even sacrifice a small thing for our sins, our own, but this Son, Jesus demonstrated his true humility, coming low down to that cross because of our sins, because of what we do. What do we do after knowing what he went through, after knowing how scooped through, how much are we willing to offer? Some of us, Claire, we are, we say like we are humble. We are here battling with pride. The pride had strings that pull all the time. We have given the demons away because when you're proud, sometimes it's not easy to know how proud you are. Pride is a killer. Pride is a destroyer. Pride is a stopper of many destinies. It has come and taken over all we are supposed to have as children of God. It has done the receiving instead of us receiving. It has done more harm than good. To grow in humility, we must allow the truth of Christ's incarnation and death to affect the way we act towards one another. To grow in humility, we must allow the truth of Christ's incarnation and death to affect the way we act towards one another. In our daily humility, it is hardly ever emphasized as a Christian virtue that we must appeal. We must exalt the opposite. We must have things that will glorify God. We must have qualities that bring our mandate to pass. Humility is a foundation of Christianity. If you're not humble, if people look at you the moment they look at you, they run away. What are you? You have to give to receive. You have to surrender something outside yourself to gain strength within yourself. You have to conquer your desire to get what you crave for. Success is the lead of the greatest failure, which is pride. Failure leads to the greatest success, which is humility and learning to fulfill yourself. You have to forget yourself to find yourself. You have to lose yourself to find yourself. You have to pass away. You have to really die because when you don't die of yourself, you're always giving yourself success and hope that is not there. The more you make this world all about you, the more miserable you will become. The more 
hate you will have about yourself because you think everyone should praise you and everyone should worship you. Everyone should see you, which is different from true humility. True humility is a proper attitude towards self that results in proper action towards others. Have this attitude in yourself. Jesus Christ could rightly have thought, I'm the internal God. I'm not about to become a human being. Let alone be a servant. Let alone die. I'm glad he did not think like that. Because he didn't think like that, we are able to be in his presence. We are able to have that grace. Who are we? According to the scripture, we are a rebellious nature. We are rebellious sinners at heart. We have gone all away and despised God who created us. But by his undeserved favor, we become his children through faith in Christ. By grace, he has forgiven all our sins and he has made us members of Christ's body. He has entrusted that spiritual gifts to us to use for his kingdom and glory, not our own kingdom, not our own glory. As a result, we have a great privilege to serve others for Jesus' sake, but the gifts he had given unto us, the privileges he has given unto us, how have we used them? How have we taken seriously what he has given unto us? The human nature, has failed us to tap into what he has made for us to have. We have forgotten whom he has done to us. He has given more grace. He has given more grace. He has said he resists the proud, but gives them to humble. The more God gives more grace, the more he can give more power, the more he can give more membership, the more he can give more lifting, the more he can give longevity, the more he can give liberation. But there is one thing, whatever he gives you is not the last that he gives. Everything that he gives, there is more of it. When he gives grace, he gives the same grace, but he gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. So he, if he gives more grace, he resists the proud. If you're not humble and he resists you, what you get, nothing will be done through vine glory. But in rawness of mind, let each other feel better than the other. Because the more he gives more grace, the more he punishes, the more he resists you. And when God the Father resists you, everything fights you. As I had say, earlier said, even sometimes you sit on my chair, my son usually tell me, this chair is beating me. Even the chairs will beat you. Even the animals will jeer you. The plants will also refuse you. Everything will fight against you. They will gang against you and you wonder what you are. True humility means renouncing self for the sake of others. Deprive of self motive and ambition. Deprive yourself. Deprive. Jesus had to renounce any self-will. When he came to earth and went to the cross, in the gate of, in the garden, he prayed, not my will, but yours be done. In Luke 22, 42, not my will, but yours, God, be done. Of course, he had no sinful will to announce. Well, as we fight with our sins every day, he had no sin to announce. But he was saying, not my will, but your will. True humility means dying of self daily. Doing God's will. Are we ready to go where he wants to go? Where he wants us to go? You say, God, your will. Let your will be done in my life. More of you, God. Lord, I want to know you. Lord, I want to understand you. Lord, but are we ready to set ourselves in motion to see God's will done? Are we ready to take instructions? Are we ready to set ourselves apart for God's glory for his use? If they tell you to fast for one day, are you willing to fast for that day? Or you're going to give an excuse of answers? If he says set yourself apart, be like an ego, be aside, search for me, look for me. Are we ready to sacrifice anything for his grace? Are we ready to sacrifice anything? Son says, not my will, but thy your will. 
But the moment you say his will, what is our father's will? Do we know our father's will? Are we ready to tap in our father's will? True humility means rolling ourselves to lift others up. Our lives have to be lived for the benefit of others. That's what Jesus supreme did. It giving up the splendor of his glory in heaven. To hang naked on the sinful cross for our sins. It would be impossible for us to go that extreme. I don't know any of us can even sacrifice for a daughter or a child or a spouse in most ways. Even when they are sick, sometimes we can't stay to look after them. We tell our children, we leave them. The helpers will have to look after them because we are rushing to chase the world. We are rushing to do other things. When we are called to minister, we'll give all excuses because we are not ready to lift others up. God has put into you that gift. We have different gifts. We need each other in different ways. God has given them to us to supplement each other. When you're called for ministry, how do you deal with it? When you're called to serve, how do you serve? What attitude do you go with? We need to lower our view of ourselves so that we can serve others. If you ever find yourself saying that task is beneath me, that task is under me, that is for cleaners, that is for a sweeper, that is for a clerk, that is for a verger, that is for a warden, check yourself, my sister and my brother. That is not true humility. True humility is when you're willing to come from up and you go down. True humility is when you're willing to give a hand to a stranded brethren, whether he's of low class, whichever category, because in God's kingdom, there is no that one higher and down. We are all his children. We are serving in the same vineyard, only that some are more privileged than others. True humility reads and the rights for the sake of serving others. You have to serve others. Did Jesus have a right not to come to this earth in a humble way he did? Of course he did. Did he have a right not to go to the cross? Of course, but he yielded all his rights and became a bond servant for our salvation. A bond servant was the extreme bottom of the ladder when he came to the rights because he had none. He didn't have a right to his own time. He didn't even have a right to his own life. This does not mean that we become slaves of everyone else's wines and desires. It does not mean that we run out to everyone just like crying in every way. It does not mean that if we are saying we are humble, we will entertain all things that are not in God's will, all things that are not in God's direction. We will not go to the bus to clean the bus because we are humble, no. Jesus was obedient to the Father, not what others thought he should do, not what others, but what God wants us to do. We should do our things in God's will, not our will. Or we'll become enslaved to do what others want. We should become enslaved to do what God wants us to do. Jesus told the disciples that when a slave comes in after a day of working in the field, his master does not serve the slave dinner. The slave has to fix dinner and serve the master. And only then is he free to eat. Jesus concluded by saying, so you too, when you do all things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that that we ought have done. That is Luke 17.10. The only right I have is a right to hell if I'm doing the wrong things. Any privileges I enjoy are by God's undeserved favor. If we have obeyed God, we have only done our duty and we should regard it as a privilege. We should not feel we deserve extra credit for serving God, but no, it's a privilege. We don't need people to cheer us up, to clap for us, to worship us, to thank us for doing our duty or work. No, it is all for the glory of God. We have to serve others in obedience to God, even at the greatest personal cost. The cross was painful beyond description for Jesus, not just because of the physical pain, but because he who was totally without sin endured the wrath of God by becoming sin for us. And a personal cost 
we have to bear in serving Christ is nothing by the way of comparison. Even though it means laying down our lives, as Isaac says in a certain hymn, that love is so amazing, love is so divine, it demands our souls, our life, and our all to serve. In true humility, we have to draw ourselves. We have to accept what God is saying. We have to ask God more of you, Lord, more of you. When you are healing other people, God, don't do it without me. Do it along with me. Help me. I need you. I need to understand you. I need to walk with you. Humbleness allows us to experience victory without consent and defeat, without shame. It is a key to constant learning and long-term success. It is a key that God has given us to do his will, to walk with him and do everything that is in his will. As I come to a conclusion, if you're experiencing friction in your relationship, whether at home, whether at place of work, whether in relationship, anywhere, chances are you need to grow in humility. Pride has been the chief cause of misery in every nation, in our homes, in workplaces, in relationships since the world began. Pride always means enmity. It is enmity. And not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. In God, you come up against something. In God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurable superior to yourself. Unless you know God, unless you understand him, unless you know the master you serve, there is nothing yourself can compare to. You cannot compare yourself to God. You have to know yourself. You have to calm down. As long as you're proud, you cannot go, know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Because your eyes are always looking down, they are not looking up. Because you think you're up, definitely you might even be the last in your thinking, bringing yourself up. Since then, the Son of God descended from so high a height. How unreasonable, unreasonable we are, who are nothing, and we are lifted up with our pride. We must fight pride in our lives. When we think we have conquered and turn to get congratulations from the crowds, and we turn to get praises and worship from other people, Pride stabs us in the back. It won't be dead before we are. We have to die before pride dies. We must fight pride by focusing on what the Savior did for us, by leaving the glory of heaven and coming to die for our sins. We have to have that in mind, which was Christ. Do not think from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also interest of others. Until we are humbled and realize that we are nothing without the Lord, we cannot be where God can use us for his glory. Let us look at different questions that will reveal something for our humility. Do we allow others to take a high position than us? The second question, are we willing to take criticism without reaction? The third one, do we ever boast about our positions, appearance, possessions, and accomplishments? Do we take pride in what we do? Are we honest about our failings and deficiencies? Do we try to look better than others in our attires, in our teachings, in our talkings? Do we look down on others who are benefit us? Do we seek forgiveness of others when we recognize that we have sinned against them? How do we treat people we come across? 
What do we say about ourselves? If this worship I hadn't come to sing, I wonder what was going to happen. Everyone was going to sleep. Ha, we've survived that minister. If she had ministered today, the whole church was going to doze off. Ha, that, that one, that girl didn't come. Who are we? Action point. How can we humble ourselves? One of the major ways suggested by the scripture is by engaging the fasting and prayers. Let God reveal who we are. Let us welcome criticism. Bless those who curse us. Let us volunteer for mental tasks. Let's ask others about our brown folds so that they will tell us who we are. Let us express gratitude. Let us listen to others instead of talking about ourselves. We find someone has been talking about from the time we come to the end. Let us kneel in prayer. Let those in authority over you make final decisions. Let's ask for forgiveness for wrongs we've done. Let us praise and honor others. Let us give sacrificially. Let us dwell in his word. Let us accept who we are. But one major point that we have to go in is when we look at Deuteronomy 8, 18. Let us not forget where we've come from. Let us remember where God took us from. Where did God take me from? Who took me from where I was? If we can remember, it will be the master key to beating the life at its game. Let us keep the memory of the pains we had before we came who we are. Deuteronomy 8, 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God. And for it is who he gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which is so to your fathers as it is in this day. By then, the son will help us demonstrate to humility. There are things we have to learn in order to represent our father. Thanks a lot. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to demonstrate humility, to be our savior and redeemer. We praise you, Jesus, for the praise you, you paid, the sacrifice you made, and the unthinkable suffering and death you willingly endured on the cross for us. Because of you, we are forgiven, and we are made peace with our creator. Thank you for giving us a new birth into a life of hope. Because of your resurrection, you enlarged our path under us. So our feet do not slip, Lord. Thank you that we've been saved and reconciled to you because of your son, Jesus. Guide every step. Lead us in your righteousness and make your way straight before our face. As we draw close and walk in intimate relationship with you each day, we pray you will get us where we need to go. Even as Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. So we say to you, not our will, but your will be done in our lives. We'd like to do your will, oh my God. You are more important to us than anything. Your will is more important to us than our desires. We want to live as your servants, doing your will from our hearts. Father, we want to be changed. We pray those changes will begin now and today, Father. We know we cannot change ourselves in any way that is significant or lasting, but by the transformation power of your Holy Spirit, all things are possible, God. Grant us according to the riches of your glory to be strengthened with the mighty through your Spirit in the inner being. We know, Lord, that you will supply all that we need according to your riches in heaven. Oh, my God and Father, Come separate, separate us from the world without becoming isolated from it. May your love manifest in us. May you be a witness, O oh Lord. Let us come before your throne. Grant us the spirit of humility. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. Try us and know our anxieties. See if there is any wicked way in us. Lead us in a way everlasting King of Kings. Come and have your way in our lives, my God, and my 
my father. Lord, lower us. Lower us, my God and my father. As we learn from your son, may we take the true nature, Lord. Oh, my God and my father. I pray each one on this forum to bring repentance unto the Lord and ask Father to search their hearts and search them with two minutes to ask God that purify you, to reveal any doubt within you that you need to bring repentance. Lord, thanks for ministering to me personally. Thanks for speaking to me. Oh, my oh Lord, I give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen.